Good morning. Again, we welcome you to worship at Messiah Lutheran Church. Today's texts from Scripture assure us that when we take up the cross, Jesus will provide everything that we need for the journey as his followers. Strength and courage, endurance and patience, hope and love. In gathering us as God's people, we walk through this journey together encouraging one another with words of peace and feeding one another with Christ's own body and blood given for us. We are gathered for worship this day in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the aid of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that attentive to your word. We may confess our sins, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May we join together confessing our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your loving kindness. In your great mercy, wash away our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Do not remove us from your presence. Do not take your spirit away. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and sustain us with your Holy Spirit. Amen. God is merciful and gracious, granting forgiveness through Jesus Christ, who was given to die for us. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Generous God, your Son gave his life that we might come to peace with you. Give us a share of your Spirit, and in all we do, empower us to bear the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading for this day is from the 11th chapter of Numbers. The rabble among them had a strong craving. And the Israelites also wept again and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic, but now our strength is dried up and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, all at the entrances of their tents. Then the Lord became very angry and Moses was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you treated your servant so badly? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you laid the burden of all this people on me? Did I conceive all this people? Did I give birth to them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a sucking child to the land that you promised on oath to their ancestors? Where am I to get meat to give all this people? For they come weeping to me and say, give us meat to eat. Am I not able to carry all this people alone for they are too heavy for me? If this is the way you are going to treat me, put me to death at once. I have found favor in your sight, and do not let me see my misery. So the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me seventy of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tent of meeting and have them take their place there with you. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered 70 elders of the people and placed them all around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him 
and put it on the 70 elders, and when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. Two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the Spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the, in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, one of his chosen men said, My Lord, Moses, stop them. But Moses said to, to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Here ends the reading. Our psalm for this day comes from Psalm 19. The teaching of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold, sweeter far than honey, than honey in the comb. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can detect one's own offenses? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound and innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us, for truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Let me invite you to consider today's first reading. Now, I'll make no claim to be a scholar concerning the book of Numbers. But what we have today is a good narrative, and I had 
fun in thinking about it over the course of the week. So quickly, here's the setting. As you know, the people of Israel have been enjoying the freedom from the tyranny of Pharaoh. The experience of oppression and cruel slavery was behind them, and, and now there were loads of stories to be told around the fireside, stories of how God had heard their cries of agony and had entered in and had delivered them. Stories of Moses, of Aaron, of Miriam leading them through the waters of the sea and towards a promise of deliverance and life and freedom. Stories of Pharaoh's prized charioteers being swept away by the sea's raging return. Stories of how God daily supplied their needs of sustenance. And yet, it seems that memories and manna were no longer enough to support the children of Israel on their journey. And so our first lesson begins by saying that some rabble among the people had a craving. The remembrances of bitter tears and slave, slavery seemed to be quickly fading, and now it was the savory smell of roasted meat, the sweet taste of broiled fish, and the wonderful memories of cucumbers and melons, of leeks and onions and garlic that, that were coming to mind. And so God's people began to think and to talk among themselves. You know, maybe things hadn't been so bad in Egypt. Sure, sure the job was awful. For sure the hours were long and the benefits lousy. But at least they grumbled. At least there were three squares and a cot. We had wonderful food and a place to lay our heads, they wailed in their lament. And now in the desert, what is there to look forward to day after day? It's walking and manna, walking and manna. And so they grumbled, at least in Egypt, we had blah, blah, blah. You get the picture. Now, of course, grumbling was something that they were well acquainted with, and they had become great practitioners. Recall that when they arrived at the edge of the sea, they complained that the Pharaoh's army would slaughter them right then and there. But with the rush of a mighty wind, the waters of the sea were held back, and the children of Israel walked to new freedom upon dry land. The waters were held back until the Egyptian armies attempted to follow. The mightiest army in the world was swallowed up by the Red Sea waters, and the people rejoiced, but not for long. Because before the taste of freedom had been fully savored, their mouths turned to sour grapes, and those saved and delivered people complained about the lack of food in the wilderness. And so Moses sought out the Lord, and the Lord delivered them from the slavery of hunger, providing them with bread from heaven. We're told that they called it manna, which in Hebrew roughly means, what is this stuff? So each day, every day, they gathered all they need. Each day, every day, they ate their fill. Each day, every day, they rejoiced, but not for long. And not for long because they wanted more. They had had their needs and God had provided. They needed water for the journey and God delivered. You may remember that Moses was instructed to tap his staff upon the rock and fresh, clean water flowed freely. And once again, the people rejoiced, but not for long. Because in spite of all God's blessing, they wanted more. They said they wanted to be God's people, so God gave them the law, and the people rejoiced, but not for long. You see, God was leading them by the hand through the wilderness. God was providing for every need, down to the sandals on their feet and the clothes on their back.
but it never seemed to be enough. Manna was okay, but it did kind of stick in the throat. Oh, for a steak, perhaps a chili cheeseburger and fries. And oh, they weren't the type to suffer silently or in the comfort of their own surroundings, oh no. They stood at the door of their tents, wailing their laments so that Moses, even the great leader Moses, God's chosen to deliver Israel Moses, so that even Moses calls the Lord's intentions to question. If this is the way that you're going to treat me, put me to death at once and do not let me see this misery. Well, we may smile at their insatiable souls, but we know those souls all too well, don't we? Their history forged in the sight of the mighty acts of God and the promise of land, their own land, a land flowing with milk and honey, awaiting their future. But nothing that God did for them was enough at least not for long. And so the blessed and expectant people of God, anxious to enter the promised land, gives way to a grumbling lot who want to return home to Egypt and bondage. Now the issue raised in these verses it's not exactly one of need, and I say that it's not one of need because God had provided for the needs of the people in the wilderness. The issue is that these chosen people of God are infected with the idea that things could be so much better if only they could do things and live life their own way. In all their moaning about meat, the people reject the very gifts from God that have kept them alive through their days of need. And by the way, lest we forget the meat they so desperately craved from the beginning of their wilderness journey, that too was given graciously and abundantly every day, apparently just not in the quantity or quality or frequency that they deemed best. And now at this point, let me ask you a question. When you think about God, what do you think of? And what image comes to mind? And let me let you think about that for just a moment while I tell you the reason that I ask is because of verse 10 in today's lesson, where the text says, then the Lord became very angry. You know, when I was younger, I used to enjoy the stories of Greek and Roman mythology. And now I'm afraid I don't remember them as well as I did then. But what I recall is what Homer once said, that the fate of humankind is balanced on the needs of the gods. That is, for those people of antiquity, the course of one's life would, sing it, would swing in the balance of the gods' pleasure or displeasure. If Zeus or Jupiter happened to have a bad day, or if a mere mortal just happened to show a bit too much ingenuity for their own good, or if they were just a tad too attractive for the gods liking, well, zap, it is better be looking over your shoulder for a well-aimed thunderbolt, or worse, you could find yourself on an eternal course of pushing a rock uphill or battling an enraged minotaur while negotiating an elaborate maze, or you could find your head quaffed with venomous snakes. snakes. But in contrast, the image of God that I hold is the one that we sing of on Trinity Sunday, holy, 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 merciful and mighty, perfect in power, in love and purity. Though mighty, I don't see God seething over with anger, but merciful and gracious and abounding in steadfast love. And that said, the God that I see is also eternal and perfect and righteous, which means in part that God is and has been and 
always will be true to his intentions to be the creator and Lord of all, whose greatest desire is the love and faithfulness of everything that he has made. And when in the whims of our human frailty we turn from this gracious, merciful giver of life, and then God's judgment, God's wrath, if you will, is to let us go merrily on our own course, which is exactly what happens in our lesson from Numbers, isn't it? Because if you were to re read those verses omitted by the lectionary committee, here's what we'd hear. Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, and you shall eat meat. For you have wailed in the hearing of the Lord, saying, If only we had meat to eat, surely it was better for us in Egypt. And therefore the Lord will give you meat, and you shall eat. You shall eat not only one day, or two days, or just five days, or ten days, or twenty days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you. And reading a bit further in the chapter, what we find is that following their own path rather than the Lord's will is that some of God's people ate themselves sick, even sick unto death. Perhaps you question, well, what does that have to do with our lives? Well, let me go about that answer like this. Lutherans love to hear about grace, the gracious gifts of God. We hear the promises of God's mercy and salvation, which bring new life. We say we can't imagine such a world that would reject the generous hand of one who gives such gifts. Well, just imagine. Imagine a kind of world with no kindness no wholesomeness, no thoughtfulness, no gentleness, no humbleness, no niceness, no faithfulness. Can you imagine a world where families would fight over the biggest piece of the pie, where no one would allow anyone else to merge into a line of traffic, where lawsuits would be as common as traffic tickets? Can you imagine a world without God? Let me say, isn't it easy to imagine such a world? Because like the people of Israel, are we not living in a world that increasingly revolves around itself, rejecting the God of reconciling love and life? But still, you and I, we are called to remember that there is another world the world in which God brought humankind into existence because he wanted to be known, where God personally planted a garden eastward in Eden as home for his creation, where God gives Adam the desire of his heart when he created woman to be his true companion, when God supplied all their needs over and above what they could ever have thought to ask for, a world that God loved so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should have everlasting life. So which world, people of God, would you choose? In our confession this morning, we acknowledge that far too often we choose the former, former world that turns its back on God but that in our deepest yearnings we desire the world that God has intended, the world that only God can restore. From out of the chaos of our own creating, you and I, we are driven to the empty tomb of Christ, the sign of God's long suffering and redemption. The empty tomb that proclaims God's victory over our sinfulness. The empty tomb that reminds us that nothing will stop God's plan to bring salvation and peace to God's creation. For in Christ, God has come to save us all. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. We pray for the church and its ministry. Bless the baptized and encourage them in their journey of faith. Sustain all members of the body of Christ in lives of prayer, service, and worship. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We praise you for the natural wonders of your creation. We pray that you would restore damaged forests, waterways, and natural habitats and lead us to be good stewards of what you have provided. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those in authority. Give them wise minds and compassionate hearts. Strengthen them in a desire to protect the vulnerable and care for those underserved. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those struggling with disease and illness. Provide them with peace and resilience for the days ahead. Sustain caregivers with energy and patience. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the worship leaders of this congregation, musicians, lectors, communion assistants, acolytes, and ushers. Bless us through their ministry and grant them the passion to continue in their service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for all your saints, those we have loved and known, and those from every time and place. Continue to guide us by their example and reassure us of your promised salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. Broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. 
we welcome all to the Lord's table. The sacrament offered each Sunday within our in-person service of worship on Sundays at 11 o'clock a.m. Almighty God, you gave your Son both as a sacrifice for sin and as a model of the godly life. Enable us to receive him always with thanksgiving and to conform our lives to his through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And once again, the congregation at Messiah Lutheran Church, we thank you for worshiping with us. And we extend our heartfelt invitation for you to join with us again in the coming Sundays, either online beginning at 11 o'clock a.m. on Sundays or by joining us for public worship at 11 o'clock a.m. within our sanctuary at 1106 Yeamans Hall Road in Hanahan, South Carolina. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.